Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Vivek Dhawan, Assistant Professor, Bombay College of Pharmacy, welcoming you all to the second day of five-day AICT sponsored ATL online faculty development program organized at Bombay College of Pharmacy. We have begun our journey yesterday with learning about various computational strategies and tools that would enable us to engineer new drug molecules. Today we continue to gain knowledge about newer trends in drug discovery ensued by insights into synthesis and process chemistry. For our first session today, we have our very esteemed faculty, Dr. Alka Mukne, to chair the session. Madam heads the Department of Pharmacognosy and Phytochemistry at Bombay College of Pharmacy. I now welcome Dr. Alka Mukne on board to chair the first session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Vivek. And uh, again, welcome to all the participants. The after the day long session on uh, molecular modeling and uh, uh, CAD that we had yesterday, uh, we are we begin our session today with a topic that is very, very important. Drug repurposing uh, becomes very important in view of the current uh, pandemic that we are in the midst of where uh, the health crisis that we are faced with, we really don't know what has to be done. And what we try to do is look at drugs that have already been discovered or developed for uh, some other maybe even related indications, but can they be used? So that is what drug repurposing, and that's how it comes so much in focus. Uh, to talk about this very, very important topic, we have none other than Professor uh, Mariam Digani who is the Sir Dorabji Tata Professor in Pharmaceutical Chemistry from the very prestigious Institute of Chemical Technology. Uh, Professor Degani really needs no introduction, but as a matter of formality, uh, so we do the job. Uh, she has been head of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Technology in Institute of Chemical Technology, ICT, the erstwhile UDCT. Uh, uh, if you, as you can see, her areas of research interest uh, have been she's been mainly been working in the areas of drug discovery and process chemistry and uh, uh, hugely successful research which is obvious from the collaborators in the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, number of industry projects that she's taken up and the collaborators like actric brc tifr ncl li lily open source drug discovery all uh, top notch uh, uh, research bodies she has completed or she has uh, she has over 80 publications to her credit with over 700 citations to international patents and several Indian patents. She's guided 24 uh, PhD and over 60 master students for the commendable work that she has been doing in academic uh, uh, pursuits and in research. She has been awarded the distinguished alumni award by Siusha College of Pharmacy in 2007 the Gharda Award for Research Publications in 2009 and the Best Teacher Award of ICT 2013-2015, also the Fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. So uh, with these very uh, uh, few words of introduction, I, on behalf of Bombay College of Pharmacy, welcome Professor Mariam Degani to take over this session and tell us all about drug repurposing. Welcome, Madam. Thank you very much, Alka, for that very kind introduction. And at the outset, I would like to thank Krishna Priya, as well as all the other organizers, including Sagar, Vivek, Alka, and others who I'm sure would be working behind the scene to get this FTP together. It's my pleasure to be part of this and share with you some insights about repurposing, both of course from literature as well as from uh, my own research laboratory. Of course, we do not uh, do repurposing in the strictest sense of the word is take one drug and check it for another disease, but we do use a lot of these repurposing strategies to build newer molecules from older templates. So I hope you can see my um, presentation now. Yes, Adam. Okay, so let me begin with a quote from Nobel laureate. 
the most fruitful basis for the discovery of a new drug is to start with an old drug. This was mentioned by Sir James Black, a Nobel laureate who discovered some wonderful drugs and his words hold true even today. So what is drug repurposing or repositioning? Could be held with several definitions. An approved drug in one disease area could be found to be active in another disease. Or the uses of a drug active in one disease could be used as a template for the synthesis of derivatives for another purpose. So this is what we have been doing in our lab, but I'm going to also talk a lot about this part, especially with related to COVID related drugs. On the other hand, an interesting sub part is drug rescue. So developing new uses of a drug that failed to progress through clinical studies or which was removed from a market for one condition, but all the research that has gone into the making of that drug could be put to use again by choosing it at a different dose or in a different formulation or for a different purpose which requires a lower dose or for which the toxicity is acceptable because the disease itself requires that. So before we go to infectious diseases, I'm sure you all know, but I'm just going to kind of take you through some drugs which have been repurposed. We all know that aspirin has gone from being a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug to an anticoagulant or blood thinner. More recently, sildenafil has gone from an antihypertensive. Of course, interesting is it was never really marketed as an antihypertensive. So this is one of the uh, parameters that uh, it was first discovered and proven to have antihypertensive effects, but its side effects became the purpose of its use, that is erectile dysfunction treatment. Another interesting antihypertensive, minoxidil, went to hair loss treatment. What a difference in the kind of activities. And brupopion from an antidepressant to use for smoking cessation. Most of these were due to serendipitous observations. But what is serendipity finally? The observation was unexpected, but someone made use of that observation. And these may also be called instances of reverse pharmacology, especially in case of aspirin, where the drug was in use for ages for its anti-inflammatory uh, anti uh, use, was then used as a blood thinner. So once again, another definition, drug repurposing, repositioning, or redirecting are common terms used to describe the process of generating novel clinical opportunities for known approved drugs, whether through new indications or new commercial opportunities for already marketed drugs. So this is one aspect, but of course drugs could be used as templates and be used for designing newer molecules for newer indications. So what are the principles of repurposing? Just listed two main ones. Drugs have cryptic biological activities. When we say cryptic, it means mysterious, unusual, unknown biological activities. So when we design a drug for a particular purpose, we do not know what else it can do, what else it's capable of. And that cryptic activity can be used for repurposing. The other definition or the other principle, sorry, rather, is different diseases have a similar molecular pathway. 
this especially holds true for infectious diseases. So for example, drug use for HIV could very well have some similarity to drugs used for the current pandemic. That's because both are viral diseases, both have similar pathways by which the virus reproduces. So what are the methods in drug repurposing? One is experiential. So looking for side effects and making use of those for repurposing. As I told you, this is also called reverse pharmacology. And the other one is at the molecular level. So understanding the drug's action at the molecular mechanism level and using that for making newer molecules could be the other possible way in which drugs can be repurposed. So repurposing has been in common practice in the pharmaceutical industry for years. And by no means is it a recent approach. However, repurposing success stories and companies leveraging repurposes strategies are now increasing in number. Reviews of the field indicate that at least 46 approved drugs have already been repurposed for new therapeutic uses in the last 20 years. So let's understand something about the value of repurposing. If a drug is already made, then drug discovery, lead optimization need not be done. But for repurposing, you just have to identify that molecule and take it through quick preclinical studies. You can see that the time for preclinical studies over here is much less. And once it is submitted to the FDA, it can directly go through phase two trials and phase one trials can be eliminated because the drug has already been tested for its basic PKA toxicity, etc. So phase two, phase three goes quickly and we are seeing that in the current pandemic, many of the drugs are undergoing, repurposed drugs are undergoing phase three trials. And then of course, this part remains the same for both, but you can see that this 10 to 17 years greatly reduces to three to 12 years. And in case of COVID-19, maybe even reduce to less than three years at the rate things are going now. Uh, this is a little busy slide, but I just want to share with you something which you may relate to yesterday's lectures also. The blue stuff is computational approaches and the green things are experimental approaches. So for repurposing, we need both. But you can see the amount of data that is required. And when you have data, you require data processing. So when we say computational methods, it may be signature matching that involves comparing the signature of the drug. So it may be just its adverse profile effects with another drug or disease phenotype. For example, I mean, very, very simple and old example is if there's an antihistaminic which is causing sedation, can that be explored for its sedative effect itself? And in fact, that has been done. The many anti, older antihistaminics are being given for their sedative effects. I'm sure everyone is familiar with molecular docking and Yesterday's lectures may have gone in depth. In addition to that, genetic association and pathway mapping involves a lot of biological computational work, and this can be used for understanding the identification of potential targets for repurposing the drugs. So, a lot of biology also can be used for
for this purpose. And retrospective clinical analysis, including adverse drug reactions, etc., market surveillance could help in drug repurposing. Novel data sources, for example, large scale in vitro drug screens when paired with genomic data give novel avenues to exploit for drug repurposing. So we can see that when we talk about computational part, it is not just docking or pharmacophore, but it involves a whole lot of biology and data mining and using that to find another use for a drug. But there are challenges. What are the challenges? Too much data. For any drug, you would see piles and piles and piles of data and how to process the data. The traditional data processing methods are obviously extremely inadequate for large and complex data. And there's a huge gap between the ability to generate data, data may be patient data, adverse side effect data, some blood parameters data for hospitalized patient. All this data and the ability to integrate, analyze, and mainly interpret the data for a better purpose. In addition, big data are disparate and heterogeneous making integration difficult. So for example, if you get even a simple thing like finding out the uh, concentration required for a drug to act at the enzyme le level. So basically, if you can just see different labs would have different amounts of drug, and that is because their experimental conditions are slightly different. So generated data like imaging are even more complex to understand and convert into meaningful things because they are unstructured. They are not in terms of numerals. They are not in terms of a number, but they are very uh, qualitative and that adds to the complexity. Also, Access to various types of data like clinical trial data. Hello. Hello. Finding some disturbance. Access to various types of data like clinical trial data is very limited at the present because companies do not often disclose it. But it's interesting to find that, for example, AstraZeneca is currently revealing all its clinical trial, not all, but a lot of its clinical trial data, which would be very, very rare before the pandemic. The pandemic, in fact, has changed a lot of parameters in these challenges. Before we go to infectious diseases, I just want to briefly look at some of the failures also. So there are drugs like latripride, dean, cetriazone, and topiramate, which were originally used for different indications. They have gone and been unsuccessful in phase three or some other trials. So it's not that drug repurposing always works, and probably we will see more data like that in the current pandemic also. But of course, this is a success story, which I think most of us know that thalidomide, which was first marketed in 1957 in Europe for anxiety, etc., and morning sickness, led to tremendous side effects and births of thousands of deformed babies. You can see a deformity in a picture here. Was just thrown away for a few years, for a few decades, in fact. But after it was understood that it was one isomer which was responsible for toxicity and the other isomer was responsible for good activity, this thalidomide has been repurposed today 
for a number of cancers, including multiple myeloma, graft versus host disease, and a number of skin conditions, including complications of leprosy. While it has been used in a number of HIV associated conditions, its use is associated with increased levels of the virus. So everywhere when it is used for new conditions, it has to be studied carefully. However, it is definitely still not used in pregnancy where it may harm the baby still because the two isomers can be interconverted in the body and include resulting in malformation of the limbs as was seen in the earliest cases. So coming to drug repurposing for infections, the battle between infectious organisms or pathogens and antibiotics is the one which is continuous. You make antibiotics, pathogens mutate, become immune to drugs, and then you have to make more antibiotics. So this is now being realized that it's an ongoing condition. It's not going to change because bacteria, viruses, all of them can mutate and lead to resistance. So what are the advantages of drug repurposing over de novo drug development for antimicrobial drug discovery? Obviously, one is the accelerated drug development process. The second one is again similar for all uh, other drugs also. That is the lead candidate has been subjected to safety and toxicity evaluation for the original indication. And the preclinical phase only requires a demonstration of efficacy. The lead candidate can therefore undergo extensive phase one studies and directly enter clinical trials at phase two. Saves risks as safety, the major limitation in drug discovery is well established and costs are expected to be a third of that of novel discovery. So time, risks and costs are the pluses, but there are challenges. A drug which may have not uh, too much toxicity at a level at which it's used for a prior condition may develop toxicity if used as a much higher dose. So if that is the case, then the toxicity data right from the preclinical stage has to be redone. Again, with the dose, the pharmacokinetic profile also may change. In addition, there's always an issue of intellectual property rights. And though it's completely off the scope of my talk over here, that plays a big role in repurposing or sometimes even the preventing of repurposing. I would like to suggest, though I don't have data that hydroxychloroquine has gone yes, no, yes, no, yes, no in the current pandemic, partly because no one makes money out of it. It's just a thought. I'm not sure whether it's right or wrong, but it's not something which, which is very expensive. So Big Pharma would think twice before going into this. Of course, small pharma companies like the Indian companies have made tons and tons of hydroxychloroquine and have made money from this. Off-label uses are already ongoing. So even if the drug is not FDA approved for a particular use, a doctor can prescribe it for another use that is called an off-label use. So, Sometimes a drug is just used for an off-label use without undergoing clinical trials again for another use. And that may be because of a lack of interest in Big Pharma. Because by the time a drug comes for repurposing, if it is not early enough, 
big pharma will you lose its patenting rights and then it will not be interested in huge costs associated with clinical trials what are the resources I'm not going to go into details of this slide because some of it may have been there earlier and there was no point in my reading out databases but today access to databases is much more easily available than it was even 20 years back for example astrazeneca and eli lilly are allowing their compound collections to be used even for repurposing and several others including nih and john hopkins this list is incomplete but you can see more data from this reference there's lots of data available plus there's a lot of electronic resources available as can be seen even from our hackathon that is ongoing for drug repurposing or other aspects of the pandemic solutions drug repurposing methods could be empirical screening which could be phenotypic or it could be at the drug drug interaction level or the pharmacokinetic level or high throughput screening so several empirical screening methods are there however empirical screening generally unless we have something better is like searching for a needle in a haystack many times but if you have a magnet you can search the haystack and find the needle much more easily so that is should be used when screening is done on the other hand screening for synergy if there is a related mechanism of action is very useful resensitization of resistant microbes of course uh, one example is clavulanic acid it was originally perhaps looked as a drug in itself but it was not found to act as a drug on its own but it had synergy with beta lactam antibiotics and it resensitizes resistant microbes it can uncover the target for another drug so that is one thing which really can be looked at when we are screening for synergy and that's an important aspect which has been exploited sometimes but not enough again we come to in silico screening right from molecular docking to data mining to what is very important in today's age is network based approaches which includes systems biology and bioinformatics however the pitfalls of in silico screening are false positives and negatives and it cannot easily unearth novel targets may once in a while if someone is really really in depth and smart but otherwise these could be the pitfall for in silico screening but definitely in silico screening not talking about only docking but also data mining and other things can be used in a big way for finding uh repurposing strategies and not only for repurposing but also for new novel drugs so let us see some novel antimicrobials identified through repurposing screening campaigns so for example a library of 900 plus compounds was screened and it was found that orafopin was originally used which was originally used for inflammatory arthritis was found to be used for amoebic infections on the other hand chlorcyclazine which is used for allergies was found to be effective for hcv which is a 
completely different route, a completely different mechanism. So this is where the cryptic biological properties of a molecule come into the picture because they were not used originally for any infectious diseases and then they were repurposed for something else. On the other hand, you have an antiprotozoal drug that is pentamidine, which was repurposed for E. coli. So you can see from one infectious disease to another one. Over here, there is some similarity in the targets perhaps, which leads to its repurposing. Not going to go through this whole slide, but I'm going to start with A and end with Z. So amphotericin B, which was widely used or which is widely used as an antifungal, has been approved for visceral leishmaniasis. And zidovudin, we all know, was initially looked at for anti-cancer activity. And then it was approved for antiviral, that is HIV activity in 1987. So a whole lot of drugs have been repurposed. And if you notice, some of them are from one type of infectious disease to a different one, and others are completely different. For example, sertraline from depression to antifungal. So this would be by serendipitous observation of cure of an antifungal infection in depressed patients, which led to some more use. So there are very many interesting examples and you could go through the paper which I have quoted in this case. So to end this part of my talk, several drugs identified for antiparasitic and antifungal infections by repurposing. However, not too many success stories for antibacterials from drugs for non-infectious disease have yet been identified successfully. There are some preliminary things, but nothing has come into the market. And in a case of antivirals, they are very often repurposed when they had started earlier as anti-cancer compounds. Uh, I'm sure must have heard a lot about the drugs used for COVID-19, but I'm going to quickly take you through the salient features which come to the mind and repurposing. So before we start with the drugs, I have just put up this slide, not to go into the details, but to show the similarities of the structure of the current COVID-19 virus and HIV. We can see that it has proteins which help it to bind to the host. Of course, it has membrane proteins or rather envelope proteins and the RNA along with some N proteins, which is very similar to HIV. So obviously, I've just put HIV, but even HCV and all have similar structures and similar targets. And this helps in a great way for the repurposing of those molecules used earlier for the current purpose. Again, over here, I don't want to go into the complexities of this part of the slide, but just to revise, I'm sure all of you already know it. The three stages of replication of any virus are viral attachment and entry, RNA replication, protein expression, and viral assembly and release from the host cell. Hello? Am I hearing a question? Okay, I'll go. Again, please proceed, yeah. Okay, again, I'm going through the potential targets 
which have been identified. Again, those who are in the field, I'm sure you would know them that the targets include the spike protein, the RDRP, viral proteases, there are two of them, as well as interestingly, the host cell receptors, host proteases, and also immunomodulation and endosomes. Not going to go into the details of this, but just quickly look from the point of view of repurposing. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are highly debated molecules, but not only for COVID, it's interesting to know how they proceeded over the years. So chloroquine was synthesized as early as 1934 for an anti-malarial use. And it was studied in 1950s for extra intestinal form of amoebiasis. So here is an old example of this old molecules repurposing. In 1960s, it was now, OK, this is infectious disease. This is infectious disease. Fair enough, they may have some commonality. But over here, it was used for autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus erythematosus. So again, over here, you can see that the cryptic properties of the drug came into the picture. And because it was studied earlier for the other SARS viruses, it was quickly tested for its efficacy against COVID-19 in 2020. Hydroxychloroquine, which is a, apparently a safer metabolite, has also gone through these similar stages. It's more popular because of less toxicity involved in its use. So we come to drugs used against 3CL Pro. I told you it's one of the viral proteins. These were repurposed from HIV and HCV. Now, obviously, there is a similarity because both of these HIV and HCV are uh, viruses. So there's going to be a similarity in the targets and therefore the logic of using these molecules is perfectly visible. You can see that all of these are a kind of peptidomimetics where the peptide bond over here has been replaced by a bioisosteer and you can see that this motif is present in many of these AVIR kind of drugs you can see that OHCC NH is present in most of them. And therefore, there is a logic because they are peptidomimetics. They can stop the 3CL Pro, which is a protease enzyme, which helps to unearth for the virus an active protein. Uh, of course, Danoprever also falls in this category. But it's interesting to see that doxycycline as well as other similar compounds which are unrelated may also work over here and have been tried over here. Now again, this is a source of a completely different type of activity on the earlier target. And more interesting is Montelukast, which is anti-asthmatic. It's interesting that this also is shown to dock very nicely to the viral protein. Whether it works because of that mechanism or it's just a coincidence that it docks, we have yet to know the details. So once again, going through some structures and their repurposed uses. You can see that Sakwinavir went from HIV to COVID-19, Ritonavir from HIV to Hepatitis C to COVID-19, Lupinavir again from HIV, and same with Nelfinavir. So you can see that a number of drugs 
which were initially used for other viral diseases have been obvious candidates for repurposing and trial of the repurposing over here is on the way. The fact that nothing has been completely successful indicates that there is more to repurposing than just using the same old drug for a newer indication. Maybe what is required is tweaking the structure, using the template and making a new molecule. Of course, making a new molecule means another 10 years and may not work out for this pandemic, but may be very useful if we require this kind of molecule in the future. On the other hand, as I told you, Montelukast was first approved for as a leukotriene receptor antagonist and it exhibits good binding affinity to 3CL pro, which is a viral protease. So there's a huge difference between the original indication and the possible indication over here. Uh, Danoprever, of course, was used for hepatitis C serine protease. Again, this is similar to the target that is being used over here. These are just some pictures of docking to show you pictorical view of how well Danoprever binds in the pocket of 3CL Pro. And there are pictures like that available actually for a whole lot of other molecules as well. Of course, uh, the X-ray crystal structures would give a better indication, but uh, it's more difficult to get. On the other hand, as I told you, I was looking at Montelukast and look at that. This molecule binds also into the binding pocket of 3CL Pro unexpectedly. This is what I would say is a serendipitous binding because of a similarity which was really not planned. Change of scene, we go against, go to drugs against RDRP. And here we have Remdesivir, which has been in the news for a long time. Also Favipiravir, which is much more synthetically uh, feasible, easier to make. And we have a whole lot of others like Ribavirin, Tenofovir, Sophosbuvir, and Azuvidin. What's important if anyone wants to work with these, especially with docking, and I've seen some initial papers work differently, that people have to understand, for example, remdesivir is a prodrug. When we bind or do a docking at the receptor, this cannot be used. It's monophosphate has to be used. And then, of course, it also has to be used along with the pyrophosphate so that the active metabolite is used for the docking rather than just the original drug. The same is the case with favipiravir. So when someone docks favipiravir and then docks another molecule which has a sugar and a monophosphate in the structure. Obviously, that other drug would give better docking results, and they are wrong if you have not used the uh, active metabolite of favipiravir rather than the original drug itself. So just by the way, saying that when docking is done, we have to understand a little more about the drug rather than mechanically take the drug and put it for a docking uh, protocol. Just as we had seen earlier, we have seen for ribavirin, it started with 
broad spectrum antiviral activities in the 1970s. And then it was approved for various other indications till it came to testing against COVID-19 this year. <coughs> Sorry. In case of tenofovir, it was approved for HIV as a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. By the way, reverse transcriptase inhibitor is a similar thing to RDRP. And then again, it was looked as for HBV, that is hepatitis B, and then for RDRP. And favipiravir, support for influenza looked at for Ebola and now it's being tested for COVID-19. So Fosbovir was approved for HCV and it's looked at for RDRP for COVID-19. So several examples exist. Interesting part is Remdesivir was developed by Gilead, but it did not get approval. So it was in the pipeline. And though it was in the pipeline and in clinical trials for Ebola, suddenly it has come into the forefront and it has been widely studied for COVID-19. So, of course, there is a logic behind doing it, as can be seen, not only from the uh, docking picture, which is shown here, but also from X-ray crystallography and other sophisticated studies. But of course, uh, the interesting thing is this was a drug which was in clinical trials rather than an approved drug, and it has come into the forefront today because of the need, the urgent need and its possible efficacy brought it to the forefront for COVID. And again over here, these are just pictures to show the RDRP with remdesivir from various angles and various types of pictures. Once again over here, three drugs have been docked to the active site of RDRP, they are ribavirin, which is in blue, arpidol, which is in gray, and favipiravir, which is in orange. You can see that they bind, but there is still scope for better binding in all these cases. And whether they have actually used the active drug or the active metabolite or the precursor is not very clearly visible over here. So to summarize this part, we have right from chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which is completely different and it's now used or tried for COVID to a whole lot of antiviral agents which are being tried for different purposes. But over here, you also have a whole lot of other purposes for which they have already been used or even repurposed earlier. So what are the opportunities in this domain? We should look at other protein targets of the virus. Look for synergy. That is a little more difficult to do, but if we get synergy, it helps one drug to perform better, even though the other one may be a kind of silent partner, helps promote one drug to perform better. Also, looking at natural products is always an option it has always given us a lot of opportunities to explore. And of course, immunity boosters can be used in different ways. 
at different targets to not allow the virus to destroy the systems. So with this, again, there's a change in tag. I'm going to look at repurposing of two classes of drugs, the first one being nitro aromatics. And we know very well metronidazole, it's age old drug for amoebiasis, but right from there to antituberculous agents, we have instances of repurposing not only of the same molecule, but also modifying the scaffold to make drugs which are more suitable for other diseases. So infectious diseases are diseases of poverty, including tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, and neglected tropical diseases like trypanosomiasis, Chagas disease, and leishmaniasis. However, only 10% of R&D investment goes into 90% of the global health needs. And this is where repurposing can help because it can bring down the cost of the drug. So if you see this picture, you can see that nitroimidazoles, not the same one, but different ones, can target a broad range of parasitic and bacterial pathogens that infect different sites within the body. So when the drugs are being repurposed, they have, to, if they are being redesigned, that should also depend on where they are going to act, whether at the lungs or the liver or the stomach or wherever else. And we can see that a lot of promise is there in this class of drugs, even though they are potentially toxic. Let's see some of the history. The first compound in this class was azomycin, which was isolated from the crude extract of streptomyces bacterium and was found to kill trichomonas vaginalis. And they found that the active component was a 2-nitroimidazole. You can see that it's a 2-nitroimidazole. Several synthetic compounds may have been made but a promising one which was discovered was metronidazole. And you can see over here that this is a nitro group at the five position. So there was some modification over here. Once metronidazole was found to be useful, then a whole host of other azoles were made. You can see in the 1960s and the 1970s, a lot of Me Too drugs were made and that remained for certain amoebic and other similar diseases. Interestingly, in the late 1990s, Pritomanid was first looked for for tuberculosis, and that has led to many compounds for tuberculosis, as we will see. So you can see metronidazole itself was repurposed from the 1950s for trichomoniasis to ulcerative gingivitis, to amoebic dysentery for which it's widely used even today, to giardiasis, to helicobacter pyroli. And finally, it was not useful, but it was looked for for mitobacterium tuberculosis. You can see a range of repurposing in this one small molecule over here. On the other hand, two nitroimidazoles were a little different. You can I uh, showed you that first compound was a two nitroimidazoles. So these were also found to have antituberculosis activity, but they had certain issues. Now, I'm not going to go into the details, but the reduction potentials 
were approximately 150 millivolts higher than that of five nitroemetasoles. And the mechanisms of action of this is by reduction of the nitro group. As I told you, I can't go into too much detail, but because the reduction potentials were higher, they were more readily reduced by mammalian cells, which caused possible toxicities. And therefore, most of the time for anti-infectives, only four and five nitroemetazole regioisomers were more popular. However, these two nitroemetazoles were repurposed for radiosensitizing agents in cancer treatment. So we hear they themselves did not act as drugs, but if you give these molecules and then give radioactivity, these molecules triggered more response and therefore they can be used both as radio sensitizing agent for treatment as well as for imaging of tumor hypoxia. So these are interesting repurposing uses which are from an infective agent, a non-infective uh, uh, anti-infective agent to a uh, different type of activity. The slide, slide is a little busy, but it shows the structures of some of the drugs which I had discussed earlier. What I want to show over here is basically most of the earlier drugs were monocyclic. Even if they had another aromatic ring, it was attached to the imidazole, but not as a bicyclic ring system. A big shift came in 1989 when a drug by Hindustan Siba Gaigi was proven to be uh, an anti-TB molecule. However, as I told you earlier, some of these compounds are mutagenic. So this was mutagenic. It could not be used further, but this was the scaffold which was modified later. And two very useful drugs, Dilamanid and Tritomanid, as well as some drugs in the pipeline, have come about with this structure of a system where the imidazole had a bicyclic ring in the structure. So these two are now approved for MDR-TB and are in clinical trials for even primary TB usage. They still have the nitro group, they are still have some potential toxicities, but again over here, the indication and the toxicity are balanced and they are proven to be useful for MDRT. So here you see once again some examples of repurposing of these drugs. So from a TB agent, it's repurposed for visceral leishmaniasis also. And you can see that these two also were initially versus trypanosomiasis and these were rescued in fact that molecule was not really useful and then it was taken for other purposes and found to be useful. Not going to go into the details of the mechanism of action of nitroimidazoles but just point out a few features that the nitro group could be converted to a toxic hydroxylamine intermediate or it could lead to a formation of a radical and that could lead to DNA damage. So if we understand in depth the mechanism of action of nitroimidazoles, design of better ones, and understanding even of their possibilities of repurposing becomes more easy. And uh, this has come out that under anaerobic conditions, it acts in a different way as compared to aerobic conditions. But 
again, I'm saying I'm not going to go into the details of these aspects, but I want to introduce over here a little bit of what we are doing in this line. So, OK, I can't. For some reason this slide is not showing very well, but what this shows is most of the nitro drugs are nitro imidazoles. And what we were looking at is, is it possible that nitro is the one which is important and can we change the heterocyclic ring over here? So with a lot of designing strategies, including making a pharmacophore, understanding their possibility of toxicity, etc. What we wanted to do in our lab is convert this complex bicyclic structure, which also has a chiral atom, to a simpler structure. We made several chalcones, but chalcones were not the best. So again, we cyclized that and made several compounds with better solubilities, less toxicity and activity against tuberculosis. So basically, we've done a lot of work in this area, but I'm just giving a brief idea of the design concept over here. So what we have used is a scaffold and then we have done it's bioisosteric replacements, et cetera, in order to get novel molecules which could be repurposed for look different diseases. And interestingly, we found that the molecules that we first looked at for tuberculosis also served as efflux pump inhibitors. So we have got the data for three of our molecules which shows good efflux pump inhibition as compared to verapramil, which is the positive control. And you can see that they are much more active than verapramil, and you can see the negative control is over here. So possibility is that these molecules could be used in synergy with other molecules for TB because they act as efflux pump inhibitors. Another tack that we have done is understanding the mechanism of some of the nitroheterocyclics. We looked at a completely that is the cobrine scaffold over here. And we have found a new class of molecules. Now, if you see these molecules and if you see this, they don't have that much in common. But we have found that a possibility is that these coumarines, which are looked at for TB, are acting in a similar way on one of the enzymes where the nitroimidazoles work, and that is the nitroreductase enzyme. So here we see that it's not traditional repurposing, but what we are seeing is understanding the mechanism of action can lead to not only the same class for another purpose, but to different class for a similar mechanism of action. So that also can be done. So with this little bit about my lab's work, I go on to another aspect that is repurposing of DHFR inhibitors as anti-infective agents. I've been working on this aspect since a long time, but before I go to my lab's work, I would like to have a quick review of DHFR inhibitors. The earliest one, are methotrexate and aminoterin, which are diaminoteridines. We also have diaminopyrimidines, diaminoquinazolines, and diamino dihydrotriazines. 
So you can see the common features of all of them is this diamino group on what I can show you here is a six membered ring. You have two amino groups on a six membered ring, which is common for all these drugs. So once again, methotrexate and aminoterine, originally anti-cancer agents, have potential uses as rheumatoid arthritis agents, and they also are known to inhibit mitobacterial growth by DHFR enzyme inhibition. However, they are not used for these purposes because uh, they are a little toxic, and they are also potent m lepre DHFR inhibitors. So that is the starting point over here. On the other hand, trimethoprim, we know has been very useful for bacterial infections, and it's the optimal agent for inhibition of this biochemical processes in bacteria. They also interfere in the cellular processes associated with purines and pyrimidines, similar to methotrexate. Here we have molecules which were originally designed for anti-cancer usage, trimetrexate, now used against pneumocytes carnini, which is an opportunistic infection. And we have cycloguanil, which was originally used for malaria, which is being used for, again for some anti, uh, for some opportunistic infections. To so summarize, there are several subclasses in this series and they all have been used initially for either antibacterial or antimalarial use and intended uses in repurposing have been very widely varied. For example, you can see spinal muscle atrophy treatment is completely different from the original use has been explored. It's not that all have been, been successful, but there has been a lot of success in this area. Once again, coming to what we have done in my lab, I'm going to show you in very brief. Once again, we, it's a repeat of an earlier concept that there is always a need for new anti-infective agents because of development of resistance by the infectious organism and therefore a built-in obsolescence. There's a limited potency and selectivity of the older compounds. And of course, you have to try to minimize the adverse effects. So folate pathway as a target has been used by us mainly for exploring tuberculosis, but also some opportunistic organisms and filariasis. So targeting tuberculosis, what we did was studied in depth the key essential features, which is, as I told you earlier, a diamino group on a six-membered ring whether bicyclic or monocyclic, some linker has to be attached. And then we can have either an aromatic ring or some other hydrophobic group at this end of the molecule. So with this design, a whole lot of molecules were made and many things were studied, including where on this linker phenyl ring should the second hydrophobic group be there? What is the type of scaffold to be used over here? Whether we require an aromatic linker or even an alkyl linker, all those aspects were studied. And several series of molecules were made. The interesting part is, I'm not going to discuss this in detail because of lack of time, but we got compounds which had potency much higher than trimethoprim and toxicity much less than methotrexate and activity both in whole cell as well as enzyme assays. So we were partially successful 
in using the scaffold and modifying it to make compounds which were having potential uses. So when we were looking for anti-tuberculosis agent, we also looked at three opportunistic infections, that is pneumocystis juvoversi or carmini as it is called, Toxoplasma gondii and Mycobacterium avium complex. And we understood that these molecules that we had already designed for tuberculosis may also work in the case of these opportunistic infections. And we did a whole lot of screening, reiteration, testing, not only two, three times, but several reiterations were done and used homology modeling, docking, pharmacophore mapping, all the CAD tools we could get hold of, and also found that our molecules fitted well into the different DHFR enzymes of the different organisms. And that led to looking at the molecular docking studies in detail. You can see that there are a lot of interactions, especially with the diamino group that I pointed out initially. And you can see just the picture of the pharmacophore for the uh, mycobacterium avium complex over here. And finally, what we got is clues for the inhibitors and we got molecules which had the 2,4-diaminopyrimidine structure and we found that the electronegative substituents in the bridge would enhance the selectivity and we could design much better compounds for the opportunistic infections than uh, especially as far as the molecular mechanism and the activity at the enzyme level was concerned. These and other similar molecules were also looked for for filariasis going to skip some of this introduction here because of lack of time. But what I want to say is some of our molecules were looked at for filariasis also. And we found there was a difference because for filariasis, it was these more hydrophobic ends of the molecule, which were more useful as compared to TB and again, for the opportunistic infections, different molecules were more promising. So amongst the evaluated compounds, some of the compounds were very useful. And this opens up new avenues for discovery of lead molecules by exploiting the foliate pathway against one of the major neglected tropical diseases, filariasis. Several of my PhD students who are pictured here have all worked on various aspects of what I presented in these slides. And lastly, though it's not completely related to anti-infectious diseases, we used some of the hits of the infectious diseases compounds to screen for Alzheimer's and we found a few of them were very potentially useful for Alzheimer's as shown in the pictures over here with multi activities on various different aspects of Alzheimer's and over here three students have done a lot of work. Finally, I would like to conclude with a last couple of slides. Of course, as we all know, in times of a pandemic, repurposing is the best way forward. 
and work done in our laboratory indicates the value not only of repurposing actual molecules but even repurposing scaffolds for different uses i have some questions over here which perhaps can be answered by our next speaker and in fact i am also working rigorously on that can deuterated drugs be used in this context that's a question and i hope many of you can address some of these can natural products be explored much more thoroughly because we know from ayurveda as well as a whole lot of other detailed texts ancient texts that natural products have use but can they be explored more thoroughly to prove their uses what can we as academic academicians do and what facilities are needed to be developed in our country these are all questions which i hope could be debated and answered for better drug discovery not going to go through this list but we have a whole lot of collaborations and to prepare this presentations three students were really really helpful and of course last but not the least it's my alma mater ud city and my current place of work institute of chemical technology of course both are the same which has helped me to grow and grow in this endeavor to find new drugs and like a with a poem what drugs have you these will surely do they are very very new if those you are having they will cost your life saving you know that most old uh, new drugs are really expensive and then some more too can we use something cheaper can we repurpose if we dig deeper and find new uses for you with this i would like to thank you all for your patient listening thank you thank you professor digani for that very very interesting presentation uh, as you so nicely set up the base for uh, drug repurposing telling us all about with the basic principles and the approaches and the resources and the challenges associated uh, with drug repurposing uh, generally uh, as we are all aware big pharma has consistently shied away from looking at or developing anti infectives simply because the commercials don't work the the 4 5 or the 10 day long uh, the short term therapy associated with all of these antimicrobials and anti infectives vis a vis the lifelong usage of drugs that are required for non communicable diseases like cancers and diabetes and what have you so uh, for anti infectives drug repurposing becomes uh, i would say if not Uh, the drug of uh, the method of choice at least uh, a method that should be explored more aggressively and thank you so much for doing it so nicely for us and the participants here uh, we have a few questions and uh, uh, we would definitely like sure. to take the uh, the maximum number that we can the first question is from dr arshna gujar and she says uh, uh, i'll just read out the uh, comment and question completely fantastic presentation ma'am like nitro group can you comment on fluoro group in some literature it is said to be truly toxic and uh, in in terms of toxicity and potency would you be able to say something about the fluoro group like nitro group yes though i haven't presented we have worked and in fact sagar patel who is here has been one of my students who has worked extensively on fluoro so fluoro is very different actually from nitro i'll tell you why fluoro when on an aromatic ring has got some similarity in size to hydrogen so if you have an unsubstituted benzene ring and if you have a fluoro substituted benzene ring the size of the fluoro is virtually i mean it's a little bigger but it's quite similar on the other hand fluoro's electronic properties are completely different from hydrogen they are more like hydroxy group 
so you have a very very good uh, potential and if you see today's drugs 20 to 25 percent of today's drugs have fluorine in their structure why and why not 50 years back the answer could be in 50 years back there were not many synthetic strategies for incorporating the fluoro group today there are a lot of strategies available though it's still difficult to work with but it's much much more easier than it was 50 years back and they have a tremendous potential as far as metabolism is concerned so to tweak a drugs uh, metabolic feasibility to make it longer acting trifluoromethyl group has been often used and even just the fluoro at the para position of a benzene ring is amazing but it's very different from nitro because nitro is itself the active compound while in case of fluoro it's just basically especially when it's on an aromatic ring it's usually just there to um, add on the electronegativity or the uh, uh, size and that kind of thing to the molecule uh, so thank you professor digani i hope it answers dr rachna gujar's question uh, we have another question which uh, uh, looks pretty interesting for us academic researchers who are always so heavily dependent on extramural grants coming from industry or other funding institutes. And the question is from a participant uh, where I cannot see the name, but it says, is writing projects based on repurposing of drugs feasible today? Will institutes providing these research grants accept this type of proposals? Um, of course, definitely writing grants for repurposing would be very useful but unlike what i have presented in my work my lab's work uh, what should be done and of course there are two different aspects so in one is the medicinal chemistry aspect where you repurpose a particular scaffold or a particular a functional group for a different purpose as i've shown you for nitro as well as the diamino heterocyclic molecules but if you want to take a molecule which is already out there in the market and repurpose it then the skills and the data sets and all that would be required was much much more of clinical pharmacology rather than any chemistry involved over there so these are completely two different things so in the medicinal chemistry sense, I would say repurposing would be repurposing of the scaffold or repurposing of a functional group, which is known to be active at a particular mechanism of action in a different way. But repurposing of one marketed drug for another purpose has a whole lot of other things involved regarding patent issues and all of that. So I don't know if this answers your question, but definitely you can write grants for repurposing. It works. Uh, uh, Madam, there are a lot of questions coming in, but in the interest of time, maybe we'll take just one more. Uh, uh, this is again from an unknown part. The name is not seen of the participant. Madam, how do you identify a new target for existing drugs to repurpose? Can you suggest the approaches? Wow. So identifying a new target for an existing drug, as I have told you earlier, it could be by phenotypic observation or by a molecular mechanism of action. So in phenotypic, it would be the observations like something happens when you administer the drug which may be potentially useful and then from there the observation is taken further and the in-depth molecular mechanism is addressed phenotypic uh, observations could also be using a kind of whole organism and seeing the activity especially for infectious diseases so if a drug is used for hiv if you could use it for today's covid 19 that is a phenotypic observation but on the other hand looking at the targets 
uh, is more of bioinformatics work. So you would have to see the active sites of the targets and see if there's a similarity. So whether there is a similarity between two targets would have to be looked at from the bioinformatics angle. And if there is a similarity, not only in the sequence of amino acids, but also in the 3D structures, then there is a potential for uh, identifying that new target for that old drug. So that's, that's going in a very different direction from what is normally done as part of medicinal chemistry, where you take a target and explore many molecules. Over here, you take a molecule and explore many, many, many targets. But again, if you go randomly and explore targets, it's going to be a very cumbersome exercise. So some kind of similarity search, which I'm not the expert because it's bioinformatics rather than uh, chemi-informatics. So that would help to identify targets. Um, uh, maybe just one last question, if we can sure. take up, ma'am. It says how to. This is from Anant, uh, Dr. Anand Saikia, and he's asking how to study synergy while repurposing drugs. So there are many well-known methods. For example, there's something called as a checkerboard method for studying of synergy. So basically, you take two drugs, and if you're doing it on whole cell, for example, antibacterial effects on whole cell. So you incubate various doses singly or in combination of both the drugs. And then there is a equation which calculates very simply, uh, whether the combined effects of both the drugs when given together is better than the additive effects of each one individually. So if you can just look for a checkerboard method, you would find a uh, method. And in fact, even we have published in this direction. We have published synergy studies between drugs. It's, it's quite simple to do. Okay, so uh, I think we'll we'll end our session here uh, again on behalf of Bombay College of Pharmacy and all the participants in this FDP. Uh, Professor Degani, we extend our heartfelt uh, thanks to you uh, for taking time out and delivering this excellent session. I'm sure re drug repurposing is so much clearer to all of us uh, after your talk and uh, we look forward to having you join us for all our future endeavors as well. Thank you once again, ma'am. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patient listening. And once again, thank you, uh, Krishna Priya, as well as others in Bombay College of Pharmacy for organizing this wonderful FTP and inviting me as a speaker. I really enjoyed myself talking uh, in this session. Adam and